So you wanna know how to program calisthenics. Well, today we're gonna to deep dive into the, acu the intensification, excuse me, phase of calisthenics training. We've had a great question here from Alex Seabrook. He gets a good one, he gets a few good ones in. Anyway, we're gonna dive into it. What's up, tribe? Uh, man, I'm enjoying this uh, live stream to the Facebook group. Um, it's a little less formal than we used to do to the uh, YouTube channel. That's not to say that we're not working hard to um, give you guys value, but it just, uh, it's just nice. I feel like it's like, I feel like it's talking to a family as opposed to a stranger. Hmm. That makes sense? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm feeling that. Yeah, yeah. Good. Anyway, uh, we got a great question to dive into today. We actually got two really good questions to dive into today, but we're going to hit it off with the topic uh, today, which is um, from Alex Seabrook. And I'll read out the question so we dive straight into it. Um, hey, Rad and Yanni. People always put Rad first. You can put Yanni first every no, once like, in a while. What about me? You know, I'm here yeah, too. Yeah. Turn up every day. And Phil, yeah. <laughs> what up, Rich? Richie. Yeah, someone <laughs> asked Richie a question. I dare you, man. Yeah. He's, an, he's, a, a not, he's a brain full of, like, how do you fit all of that knowledge into one head? That's what I always think. How do you fit all of those packs under that T-shirt? Yeah. I mean, it's just got abs for days. Yeah. That's right. Um, just had a question about what to do for lower rep ranges when conducting calisthenics. I know there is the option for harder progressions, but not sure how hard I should step it up, being new to some of the movements. When lowering the reps, should I be looking for longer eccentrics and more time under tension? Oh, this is such a good question, and this is a topic that we love of talking about because yeah. it's a lot more difficult with calisthenics uh, you're you're working with leverage uh, in your body to try and make the exercise harder and most of the progressions go from short levers to long levers because long levers create mechanical disadvantage they create uh, more weight on the fulcrum point usually where you're anchoring to the bar or the floor and um, being an engineer before this, I was a mechanical engineer before this, I love talking about leverage. It's just something that I get really easily. So anyway, um, before we dive into it, how are you, Phil? Yep. You excited about today's show? Mate, I think it's a, a really important one. We've kind of, I think we've kind of touched on it like in the process of talking about other things, like with the strength testing, why we were saying it's much easier with barbells because you can get a very like defined progression when you can just add more weight onto the same movement. But yeah, we've sort of, we've gone around this topic a bit, but I think it's a really good one to tackle because for all those out there who are really trying to uh, dive deep into calisthenics, it can be such a challenging one to, to hit, yep. like, yeah, yep. to hit the right amount of intensity to actually get the progress. Yeah, and, and uh, it, the same goes with calisthenics training. It's about, like, volume is super important. So the, the other thing we're going to do today is we're going to answer a question uh, from uh, one of our um, uh, tribe members that came up on yesterday's show. Now, I'm not going to say her name today because I'm not 100% sure that she's got the confidence yet to share this in such a public forum, but we're going to... I mean, she posted on the on the On, on the, the question, group. yeah. yeah. I guess it's, so, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I think it'll be okay, but it's a really good question. It's a, it's a long um, question. There's a lot in there, but it's something that I'd really like to talk about because I'm sure other people will be having or feeling or experiencing the same things. And Spoilers, that's... her name is Grace. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Grace. And that's, uh, that's what this group's all about. This group is all about um, people with common goals, common values, all collaborating, working in unison to achieve similar um, outcomes. I'll and... tell you one thing I really like about Grace. She's a podcast listener says she finds it much easier to uh, listen to the show every day because she can put it on on her way to work, which is a bit easier than YouTube. So that's what I was really hoping for, getting this podcast uh, part of the show set up. So big thank you to Grace, and hope hopefully there's other people out there experiencing the same thing. Which yeah, is that absolutely. a bit easier to to consume it. Mate, I know basis. there is. I've, yeah. I, I've, sorry to cut you off, but I've had lots of members in the gym here say that they listen to it now um, a lot more because of the podcast. So kudos yeah. to you, bro. Okay, now... Diving into this question from Alex about um, intensification uh, phases of training during calisthenics, uh, it becomes quite complex because we're working with eccentric and isometric contractions and that's, you know, it's all about time under tension. Uh, the way we increase intensity, as I said, is that we alter the body position to make the movement less mechanical adv um, advantageous. Uh, we put more load on the fulcrum point, the fulcrum point being the, the point that your le the leverage is, is, is occurring on. So if you're in a, uh, in a, a, a lever, let's just use that because 
Mm. It's, it's, it's so obvious. If you're in d doing like a front lever, then your body is trying to collapse in the shoulders basically and you've got a lot of contraction through the lats, the shoulders and the trunk area in the core, you know. Um, I think a really easy way to think about it is if you held a, a dumbbell out at a, with a straight arm out from your shoulder at 90 degrees and um, it's you're going to get tired like pretty quickly compared to if you had it you know down by your side like a few centimeters off 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 your body so um just a really kind of easy or way to here yeah yeah you know just anywhere turn that to the side can you see that probably not i'll do this one but he's just yeah. looking for an excuse to show off his you know the, the, the yeah I'll, I'll use my smaller <laughs> arm because uh uh and so here you know extending that out it's going to feel a lot heavier than bringing it in closer to the body because the lever becomes longer and that increases the load on the fulcrum point which in this example is my shoulder does that make sense yep yeah that's cool uh okay so the good thing about this discussion is that we don't have to calculate any of this stuff. People have done it for us. Many, many people before us have treaded this path and we just have to replicate their amazing um, collaboration and knowledge. Now, Rad and I follow a bunch of coaches and we've read a couple of really, really insightful books. Uh, all of the Overcoming Gravity books are fantastic and we've sort of pulled uh, information from the people that we really like the most and put it together in a couple of really, really simple uh, diagrams that we have up as posters in the gym for our tribe. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're available to our UMS online coaching tribe. They should certainly be anyway, uh, called our ultimate isometric strength formula and our ultimate eccentric strength formula. And what these charts do is they give the, um, the user, the student, a exact formula that they should be aiming for or trying to replicate in their workout based on their best efforts. So the and I'll, I'll just explain first of all we'll, we'll explain the isometric formula um, you know what what we generally do is we get what our maximum hold in the movement that we're working on is and then we can work back from there to figure out what we need to do to be able to um, uh, get enough volume in each workout and just with the maximum hold we've talked a lot about uh, strength testing and with uh, our strength movements with our, our barbell movements or pull-ups like we talk about failure as being when you lose form so like you know even if you could punch out a few more sort of grindy reps um, that doesn't count when you're going for you know say your 6RM with your testing so with uh, your calisthenics movements does that also like is that the same so when you're it is yeah like, it's, it's when you're doing isometric even if you're kind of holding on but you start to lose it is that your yeah your hard any, any real i like to say any real alter um in your body position so you set a benchmark repetition mm -hmm. with, with what your best effort in um mm -hmm. form and technique is and then you've got to replicate that so your fail point is when you can no longer replicate that um, form that technique and that goes for pull-ups that goes for all calisthenics movements I believe that um, I, I, I view a squat as a calisthenics movement you're lifting and controlling your body weight against gravity um, and I'm a huge believer that the moment that um, you're performing a squat you, even if you've you, you're using external load like a barbell to increase the amount of weight you're lifting the moment that you're so you you set a benchmark repetition at body weight with how you can posture up the moment that that changes you alter your body position that's a fail uh, um, in my book um, and that's how I avoid injuring myself when I squat I'll go to an absolute um, limit with um, with you know a hundred hundred and 40 kilos on my back and you know it's very rare that my rep looks different from one rep to the other and you'll notice that with um with professional lifters too you know they're very very um you know you might think that their repetition looks bad because they use like a, a bit more of a round back technique or whatever else but you'll you'll notice that their rep will look exactly the same from 60 kilos to 360 kilos yeah. you know and that's really important to understand yeah. and we've been banging that drum for a week we now have. but now we'll bang the drum of calisthenics so back to it <laughs> uh, Progressing calisthenics movements. Using isometrics. Okay, so I'm going to pull up our chart here, our ultimate isometric strength chart. Now, to give you is there any way that other people who aren't in the online uh, 
program online Facebook group can uh, can get this. Can get this at the at the moment I'm not sure but hey what what we might what we might do is get uh, anyone who watches this video give us your um, uh, if you if your first name is different to your Facebook profile just give us your first name and your email address and I'll personally email this document to you it's just a PDF uh, we have it blown up to AO size in the gym here and we give it to uh, anyone in our tribe that that wants to put it up in and their garage, home gym, or whatever and else. And for the YouTube watchers and the podcast listeners, the same thing goes? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Send us. I mean, I'll figure out. Rad might be able to set something up that's a little bit more efficient than me having to personally email them to everyone just in case I get like a thousand people. Um, but I'm sure we can do something. But for now, for anyone listening, throw a comment in with your first name and your email address. I don't know if people will be willing to do that on YouTube. So we might have to set something up that's like a link or something like that, which I'm sure we can do. We'll, we'll, we'll do it. There will eventually be a link yeah. that you can click on, Happen. punch your email address in, and uh, and and we'll a automate the process so I don't get stuck with a million emails. But for the guys on the Facebook group right now, to, if you want to get this, because that might take a few days um, to get set up, uh, if you send us your first name, email address, only your name if it's different to your profile, just so I know who I'm talking to when I email. Otherwise, I don't want, I don't like to be rude. Um, then uh, I'll just email it to you. I'll get it done over the next day or two. Yeah. Great. Uh, the ultimate. And Aiden's just got a question here about where he might find it on the online program. Uh, that's a question for Rad. It, cool. it should be. Uh, I have well, to. Uh, Rad have, have a look now while we're up. chatting, and if you can find it, just uh, if you could tell us. Where you found it, so other people can find it as well. Yeah, that would, that would absolutely, be absolutely. I'm, I'm almost certain that, that it would be up there. Uh, I don't know why it wouldn't, because we give it away to everyone here, and we, and it's meant to be for you guys. That's the idea. Uh, and so, shout out to Aiden and Eddie and Quok um, for tuning in. Good to see you, and I'm glad you're liking the uh, the podcast there, Aiden. So. Yeah, absolutely. If so, anyone has any other questions as well, just get them in now before we go into a big so let rant. Me, yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're about to. I'm going to go and I'm going to talk about the key points. Uh, on this chart and um, sorry I'll repeat that again so the podcast listeners can hear because Phil hates me um, talking not into the mic uh, the key points for the ultimate isometric strength formula concentric versus isometric one concentric rep is equal to about two seconds of isometric hold again these are bullet points on the chart so all of the key points all of the most important information that Rad and I have studied we've just basically summarized in one page in a one page document that just uh, you, you, that, that's easy for the guys when they're doing a workout and their brains are the, the, um, depleted of blood <laughs> can can uh, can see. Okay. The next point is isometric hold is an exercise where your muscle neither lengthens nor contracts, is, is neither lengthening nor contracting. So an isometric contraction is when you flex the muscle for all of those playing at home. Yeah. I'd probably change that to shortening. So not lengthening, not shortening. It That's is, right. It is definitely contracting. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> you're right, actually. That's a real bad typo. Um, okay, there we go. We need to do a new version of this. Uh, good, it's good to have Phil here. Max hold, the amount of time you can hold a position performed formed one second short of failure. So that answers your question just before. So yeah. one second short of losing your uh, desired body position. Hold time. These are. This is just going through the terminology that's in the chart below it. Hold time. How long you should optimally hold the uh, repetition of an isometric exercise in a set. Total sets. The optimal number of total sets of each exercise you should perform in a workout. Total time. Your total target time in a workout for maximum adaptation of an isometric hold exercise. An optimal hold time is your optimal amount of volume reps multiplied by your target maximum hold. Now, I know that that's uh, you might be going, oh, geez. But when you look at this in the document, it makes a lot of sense, okay? And then below that, those key points is the chart, which goes from one second all the way down to 30 seconds, which is the max hold. So let's say hypothetically you were an absolute newbie to isometric movements and you were trying to break into the calisthenic scene. If your max hold one second short of failure was only one second, then your hold time would be one second and you'd do seven to 10 sets of one second. So your total workout time under tension would be seven to 10 seconds and your optimal hold time sets times hold would be eight sets of one second. So that 
would be what you'd aim for in your workout. Eight sets of one second hold, okay? Now, if we move down to something more common that's going to work oh, for... I was hoping we'd read out all 30. No, 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 no. <laughs> so something that, uh, where, around where I'm working on for things. So as an example of this, I'm still learning how to do handstands. My max hold on a handstand is about 30 seconds. So I go down the chart. I go, okay, my max hold is 30 seconds. My target hold is 20 seconds. To get a good workout for handstands, I do three sets uh, of 20 seconds and it gives me what I'm targeting. I'm trying to get 60 seconds of isometric so contraction. Handstand seems like an interesting one for me where there's so much of a balance component as opposed to just a raw strength component because yep. I'm sure you'd have the strength to hold yourself up for a whole lot more than 30 seconds. So I guess is this one as like as relevant for handstands? No, it or still is, it, is. It's an no. isometric hold. You know, you're contracting. So are you doing it up, are you doing it up against a wall or are you doing no, no, it? No. I'm doing it free freestanding, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, um, it's a isometric hold. Okay, I'll give you another example. I'm uh, in the movements that I'm working on for the planche. I'm working on a band assisted um, uh, pseudo straddle planche. Uh, my maximum hold is around 25 seconds with a really thin band. So I, about 20 seconds maybe. So if I use the chart here, I go 20 seconds. My target hold is 14 seconds. My target workout is four sets or four uh, rounds of 14 second hold, which is going to give me a total of 56 seconds isometric contraction in that workout. Um, so it's very easy to use this chart. All you yeah. gotta do is get your benchmark, you test yourself. I like to use a, uh, we've got all these little tripods here that we give our members that they can put their phone in, set it up, video themselves so that they, may, so that they can review the video and see the point where their form breaks, not where they fall down, where their form breaks. And then they minus, that's the failing point. They take a second off that and that gives them their target workout. And then they've got, they know exactly how to progress and put their workouts together. Um, does that make sense? Makes sense to me. You tell yep. me. Yep. Yeah, I think, um, and for those who are getting kind of 30 seconds and like, why does it end at 30 seconds? Then you probably could move up to a more, harder progression. A, a more challenging progression. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I think with in terms of harder progressions, it's going to be a really hard thing for us to just like give you all of the progressions for every exercise right now. So if you are particularly interested in a certain movement and you're a bit unsure, um, I imagine there's quite a lot of information on the online um, oh, absolutely. Like it's, it's all yeah. on the yeah, online absolutely. coaching. I mean, if you e even our YouTube channel. Our YouTube yeah. channel, channel gives heaps of progressions on movements. Now, yeah. um, you, you've got to remember, guys, there's a lot of movements that in calisthenics, like a planche, for instance, that neither Rad, Richard, or myself can do yet. You know, we're still progressing through this journey ourselves. I can, I just choose not to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Phil's the only one that can nail everything, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is still a journey for us, but... Uh, what people tend to comment and like about us and the reason why we're aligning ourselves with people like Daniel Badnell from Fitness FAQs and the reason why we, we resonate with each other so much is that we bring a strength and conditioning methodology to calisthenics unlike a lot of other people. A lot of other people are self-taught. They've learnt it at a very young age where their bodies are adapting very quickly to stimulus. And as you get older, if you try to start something new like calisthenics, you kind of need a little bit more on your in your toolbox than just... Um, um, effort, yeah. you know, you need proper programming, and uh, and that's where w w that's sort of what we bring to the game, and that's why we get good results with our tribe. So. Um that's uh, the isometric strength formula, the ultimate isometric strength formula. So let's have a quick talk about the ultimate eccentric strength formula because this is one that people can use a lot earlier in the game. Like our primary goal with people in Unity Gym is to make them strong, flexible, and athletic. And athletic is a very nice way of saying lean and healthy and agile and uh, coordinated and fit in, in the cardiovascular system. Um, because... Those things are required to master calisthenics, you know, make no mistake, raw strength carries over to everything. And we've seen many phenomenal examples of that. We've, we've had people do, um, you know, play, play around with us, um, uh, professional powerlifters, play around with us on calisthenics movements and demonstrate something that we have tried to do for a long time in one go because they're just brutally strong, you know. Um, and so... Our, our goal is to get people strong first and get people flexible first because, you know, um, Rad tried to do movements in calisthenics for years like um, uh, straddle press to handstand 
and his limiting factor was not his strength. His limiting factor was his flexibility, you know. And the moment he unlocked the pancake, he could just bang up into a, um, a, a hard progression on that movement. So, you know, the, the, first and for, the first goal really for everyone, I believe, and we believe here, our philosophy is get strong, flexible, and athletic first. Uh, because that comes quickly in comparison to calisthenics. Calisthenics is a game of millimetres and it takes years to master. You know, the boys that we've got doing workshops here at Unity Gym who are far uh, more advanced in calisthenics than we are have been doing it for decades, not just a matter of a few years, you know. So, um, and I find that it's a lot less uh, frustrating when you are already strong, yep. when you are already flexible, yeah. And so for the eccentrics which you were about to... We were about to share. Okay, so... I'm just going to get through the uh, the main part of this. This is a longer document that I've been working on for a little while. Where is the important stuff? Okay. We're still here. <laughs> Getting there. <laughs> you, you, you talk for a little while yep. until uh, I find the important part here. Okay. Okay. Um, Eddie's got a question here saying isometric or eccentric movements for flexibility, question mark, question mark, um, which I'm not 100% um, what you're asking there. Is that related to the sort of the end range strength stuff that we've talked about? Uh, if you could clarify that, that would be awesome. But at the moment, what we're looking at here with isometrics and eccentrics is looking at strength progressions for calisthenics. So this is looking at strengthening rather than flexibility at the moment, Eddie. But if you do want any more information on the... Uh, that's unlocking your flexibility within range strength and go back a few episodes to one of the ones where Rad and I talked about that at length. Um, how are you going over there, Yanni? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. I've found the important part. Uh, I forgot that this was quite a, a lengthy document of a few pages. It's not just a yeah, simple chart. Y Yanni's one. learning brevity in his older age. He's, uh, <laughs> Matt, you look through like Yanni's folders of stuff and it's just like <laughs> documents upon documents of like organizational stuff. Yeah, and emails got, that go for a days. Lot of, there's but, uh, a lot that comes out of my yeah, brain that, is, get, that makes it into written word and then half yeah. of it never sees the light of day, but yeah. it's just there still. Yeah, anyway, okay, so. Condensing. <laughs> look, the reason why... Um, Eccentric, uh, and, th and this is something that we should cover first. The reason why we're passionate about using eccentrics as opposed to using other, th other mechanisms, there was a question that I answered today from a, uh, a Movement Mastermind tribe member who had posted a video demonstrating a, uh, a, a few sort of pull-up exercises, and he was um, uh, concerned about symmetry in, in the development of muscle around his shoulders. Uh, that was the, the reason for the question and the video. And first of all, um, well done for posting a video because not many people do it yet in the UMS Movement Mastermind. And it was interesting to see that he actually asked if it was okay. And if it's not okay to post a video here, he'll take it down immediately. And I'm like, no, that's, that's what we want. want. That's <laughs> yeah. what we're doing it for. That's why we moved this live show over to uh, from YouTube to um, Facebook, which was a huge deal for us because we had a uh, an audience on YouTube tuning in every day, you know, and so um, it was tough because a lot of them don't want to move from YouTube from that platform over to Facebook. But the problem was we couldn't interact on YouTube the way we can here. We can answer written word comments, but we can't answer, we can't critique movement like we yeah. can on the Facebook platform. And I'm so big on learning being a collaborative thing and like, you know, just getting lectured to every day. You can only take so much in, but when you start to uh, interact and help other people out, like you learn so much from that process of collaboration. So that's just something that you just can't have on, on, Absolutely. on YouTube as easily. So. Absolutely. Now, in the comment, I in, the, in my response, to that, I made a comment in regards to using bands to assist with pull-ups. Now, we use bands a lot in the gym here for straight arm scapular strength movements because in straight arm scapular strength movements, it's either an isometric hold, so it's a fixed strength, there's no strength curve there, it's a, it's a fixed position, or it is a very small movement. You may be moving the scapula through its range of motion and it's a very small strength curve. So the, the band, the elasticity of the band doesn't in, um, uh, impair the central nervous system's ability to adapt to that strength curve as much. But with a movement- Do you want to quickly explain strength curve for- Why don't you do it? You, you, you'll probably know it better <laughs> than me. Uh, basically, so if you're just 
whenever you're uh, lifting a weight or moving against a force, you're always going to be strongest um, in your the mid range of of your muscles. So as we talked about before, whenever you're end range, so in or outer range of a muscle, which for example with the bicep curl, just because it's easy, um, if you're at the your your elbow totally straight and your shoulder slightly extended, um, you're going to be weak there, because, weaker comparatively there because your uh, muscle fibers don't have loads of overlap. And when you get into the mid range, you've got a lot more uh, overlap of your muscle fibers, and so you, you're able to produce more force. And then as you get to inner age again, where with muscle fibers they're, they're pretty much used up all their contractile ability, um, they've got a li little bit less sort of um, yeah contractile force potential. Uh, that's when you're going to be weaker again. So you can see that there's that sweet spot in the middle where you're in that mid range that you're going to be strongest. And now how that um, changes when you start adding things like bands is that depending on where the band is attached to, it's really going to uh, change that where as you stretch the band further, like longer, it's going to be at its most force. Whereas when you've, you just start to begin stretching it, it's going to be at its least force. So then you, you kind of start to, um, you, you manipulate the strength curve quite severely. And what that does is it, and we've found this personally, we used to use bands to assist people, especially in the beginning. Uh, we had people using band assisted, um, to do pull-ups for years and they never learned pull-ups. They could never still do a full body weight pull-up. And we kind of went back to the drawing board and went, what, what's going on here? And uh, after, with a little bit more research, you find that um, a, a good strength and conditioning coach will never use it because it in interferes with the strength curve, the natural strength curve. So what ends up happening is your body doesn't adapt to the true movement. And so how that, that works for the pull-up for this example is when you're at the bottom of your pull-up where you've got your arms totally straight up above your head, um, that's when the band is at its most... Um, taught and so it's going to be having its most upward force at that time so if you're able to get out of the bottom of a pull up there um, because you're getting all this extra assistance from the band um, it, it doesn't quite translate to then when you take that band away that you haven't really effectively trained that end range strength to which initiates a pull up and so you never get past that initiation sort of that's part. exactly right and that's what we found so you basically never learn to do the pull up properly now you know, arguably, if your goal is not to learn to do a pull-up, it's just about getting a, a, a workout and you just want to burn calories and you'd like to include pull-ups in that routine. Yeah, and you might get it. It'd just be a whole slower. Like, yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it, yeah. We, just did, we just found it produced mediocre results and we've found using eccentrics a much better way or, or isometrics a much better way of bridging that gap between not being able to do a pull-up and being able to do pull-ups. And since we removed bands and stopped interfering so much with the strength curve, uh, we get people doing pull-ups very quickly here who've never done one in their life. Um, and that is, of course, when you strip away body composition interference. So, yeah. you know, if you've got someone who's carrying an extra 30 kilos, the likelihood of them getting a pull-up is not going to be because you've interfered with the strength curve. But you've, you're also just getting optimal strength development when you're doing it like this. So even if you're not able to, to do it, you're still not able to do a pull-up, you're still training those muscles in a really great way. Yeah. Um, and so with people who are wondering with the pull-up, it's like, okay, sure, eccentrics, but how do I get up there again? Um, generally, the way we'll do it is get someone to have like a, um, a bench nearby which they can get up and stand on or we're using the bars across the, yeah. uh, the squat racks. And so starting in that ideal position, so it's not starting with your shoulders rolled forward and your... Um, you know, uh, all hunched and your chin just barely touching over the bar. It's starting from that really good position of uh, your chest is to the bar, your shoulders are back and down, and you're trying to maintain that as you lower back down. Um, and again, why eccentrics are so useful is just like I've explained before in previous episodes about, about uh, concentric versus eccentric. Uh, if you, you know, say your maximum squat you ever have been able to do is 50, 50 kilos. Um, where you can get up from the bottom of a squat with 50 kilos on your back, um, you could definitely have a whole lot more um, weight on your back and slowly lower that down. You just wouldn't be able to get back up again. So you might be able to do 100 kilos on your back and lower it down, but you won't be able to get back up. And so this is where you can see how you can really load the system a whole lot more than you can when you have that concentric component as well. And this is where it becomes really useful for the pull-up. Yeah, that's right. Uh, to break, to, to really to break through strength plateaus in almost any movement, you can use eccentrics. Now, what I'll do quickly is I'll go through the the ducks nuts of the um, protocol here to give you an idea of how eccentrics compare to concentric reps and uh, how to progress them, what to look for, what benchmarks you should be going for, and all that sort of thing. Um, 
And again, it's a bit convoluted because my, my notes here, I, this is an unfinished document, which makes it even worse. So I'm just reading it from here. Now, the, 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 the main thing is uh, to go for um, three consecutive eccentrics with consistent eccentric tempo for seven to 10 seconds each through full range of motion. That is the ultimate goal. So you're going for three consecutive reps. The word consecutive is e extremely important there. That means that there is zero rest or pause between each rep. So you, let's say hypothetically in Phil's example, you start with your chest on the bar in that perfect top range of a pull-up position. You lower your body down nice and slowly all the way through for seven to 10 seconds. It should take, this is the, the, the top benchmark. This is what you're striving for. Zero pause until you get yourself back up there and go back through it again. And once you can do those four things, it's usually um, where you, can, you, you should be able to go over and do one rep, one full concentric rep quite comfortably. And so what we do when we're teaching someone how to do a movement like a pull-up, and we use this for muscle-ups as well, we use this for other um, uh, quite um, technical calisthenics movements, we reverse engineer it from that point. So we go, okay, here's the goal. We need to get you to three seven to 10 second eccentric consecutive reps with zero pause and perfect form. And we know that at that point, 99 out of 100 people will be able to do demonstrate one perfect form concentric repetition. And once you can do that, we move into what's called hybrid sets where we will do our one concentric, then we'll do eccentrics, then we might finish with isometrics or something like that to get enough volume in the set. We won't talk about that today. We'll, I'll leave that for another day. So Cox got a question here and, and as well as an appreciation for your, your turn, the duck's nuts. Um, and he's saying, can you use eccentric reps for the pull-up? So for someone who maybe can't get that full seven seconds. Oh my God, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So. so, well, here's the thing. When you start out doing eccentrics, I guarantee you, if you're new to this, you won't be able to do seven to 10 second eccentric reps. That's brutally hard. And so you might have to start doing two second eccentrics where you get yourself up and it's 1,000. 2,000 down. That might even be hard. You may only be able to do one second. And that's where the sort of science comes into, okay, how many reps do I need to do at my current ability to be able to get enough volume into the set and into the overall workout to elicit enough of a response? And so do you have a way of people being able to figure that out? I do. And it's here. It's just there a little bit convoluted. So eccentric strength formula. That's exactly right. So <laughs> what, I, what I might do is finish this document uh, so that I can provide it to you guys sometime yeah. this week. But hopefully you can just like even, you know, I think people really like these sort of prescriptions of like do exactly this, but hopefully you can just see the principles that we're working off here about how you can progressively overload body weight movements, just how the same way that, you know, you overload strength um, uh, barbell movements. Hopefully you, you're seeing that there's principles here that you can play around with and, and, and likely get quite good results. Exactly so. right. And and these methods of um, diff using differing contractions are extremely effective at, at, at teaching you new movements as opposed to getting uh, assistance from other mechanisms like bands, like assisted pull-up machines. I hate assisted pull-up machines yeah. because you stand on a, a solid platform that removes the stability mechanism there. Like there's not just the global muscles producing a, uh, a, a bend in, an, in a joint or a series of joints in a pull-up. There is like deeper um, things happening there. There's a sequencing of stability muscles like the yeah. rotator cuffs. You know, also core. your core holding yourself in that position and all sorts of stuff That's that you're getting right. out of it. So. Yeah. And so if you start by using assisted machines in a gym that uh, provides them, then you may feel like you're doing a pull-up, but you're not at all. It is it is zero carryover to a real pull-up, except maybe that you're training the elbow flexors nicely, or you'll get, you're getting a contraction in the latissimus dorsi, but it's kind of more like doing an isolated latissimus dorsi movement and hoping that that's going to carry over to doing a pull-up. Which is, it will, but it's limited. It's very limited. So, that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, with eccentrics, one thing that definitely would like to throw out there before people go out and, and, you know, dive right into this, eccentrics are always the ones that give you the most doms. So if you really struggle with delayed onset muscle soreness, so that kind of soreness where you've done a hard workout the day before and then the next day you can't really move, uh, this will do that in a big way. So I'd recommend for those guys out there who haven't done much in the way of pull-ups but are really working on, on some, 
don't do the hardest, you know, most e eccentrics you can do on at the first time round. Like just start easy, as we always, always, always talk about with um, getting into exercise for the first time. It's always about just a slow ramp up, and it's just giving you respecting that your body takes time to adapt. And if you respect that, it will optimize how you do adapt over time because you won't overdo things and then go into that unfortunate trough of sorrow, sorrow as people when people get those um, injuries from load, poor load management. So yeah. just start out slow, get your body used to eccentrics because your body, if you haven't done eccentrics, will take time to get used to it. And then you can gradually increase yeah. from there because yeah. they do hurt. <laughs> now, also one sh quick thing for anyone in already subscribing to the UMS online coaching program, you have access to the Muscle Up Masterclass, which is a periodized special a strength specialization program for pull-ups there's two phases of it one uh, there's two there's two programs in there one is for an absolute beginner who can't do one pull-up to get them to doing um, reps of pull-ups and the next the, the second program is for someone who can already do pull-ups to get them to be being able to do multiple reps of a muscle up and it is a, um, a five phase periodized program it's a huge I, I believe it's probably some of my greatest work it's some of my best programming put into that and um, yeah, not a lot of people use it so if your sticking point in your programming or exercise is a pull-up or you've just always wanted to do a pull-up if you're already subscribing to the UMS you've got access to all those special strength specialization programs just sitting there uh, you just have to dive in and and, uh, and and work through them if you are not then what the hell are you doing you, you got to <laughs> subscribe now you can buy any of our strength specialization programs as a, as a standalone product if you're not wanting to do a to, um, to join the UMS online coaching subscription um, and you can hit us up for that if you want or they're all available through our website yeah. um, now so Blakely has a question here just about lat pull downs and, and what you think about them I'll jump in and say that like uh, again if you feel like your limiting factor is that elbow extension and, and adduction then maybe as like a uh, you know, we, we talk about having, when you have your pull-ups, your vertical push and pull, that's always coming as the A exercise in your workout. So that's the one that you do when you're fresh and you're, you, you're putting everything into it. And if you just did that that day and you didn't have time for everything else, then like, you know, still tick that box that you've done a good workout. Um, I don't think that pull-downs down in as like a, you know, C exercise really like <laughs> yeah yeah uh, my my answer to that and uh, I'll add to that uh, lap pull, pull downs are fantastic they're great they're, are they essential in training absolutely not uh, they're a really nice um, addition to help overload a muscle to add volume to a muscle I wouldn't do them in replace of a pull up ever um, and you know if you've got access to them in a gym and you feel like really overloading that area of the body then they're a great supplementary movement to add to the program um, they're also you know uh, I've, I've found them really useful in uh, preparation phases and remedial phases I never use the bilateral for that I'd, al I'd always put a single arm attachment but single arm lat pull downs are a really nice way of getting people um, to understand scapular movement really well and you can do them nearly half kneeling kneeling or even seated usually when you do a lat pull down seated it, you don't get um, full extension on a single arm unless you're really short um, if you've got a big wingspan like myself or Richard or Phil it's they, often they don't quite pull you up into full sc um, scapular elevation uh, but yeah I think they're fantastic in a remedial environment like that um, cable machines and um, you know the good thing about cable Cable machines as opposed to bands like we were talking about before is that it's a constant strength it's a, it's a constant consistent load um, so that you're not interfering with that strength yeah curve. and the other thing I, I also think about when I'd find it really useful is if I was working with a swimmer who really need to have good muscular endurance in their lats and when you're just working on pull-ups and calisthenics movements it's really hard to get into that sort of endurance like rep range of training because it's hard to deload it in a sort of meaningful way so um, if you do need sort of muscular endurance in those muscles and lat pull downs are a great way of being able to target that while also doing it in a really sort of controlled um, manner. Yeah, and yeah. bodybuilding. You know, bodybuilding, they're yeah. trying to put as much volume into the muscle group as humanly possible. And a lot of the time, that requires them to be switched off in other areas of the body so that they yeah. can just really isolate those yeah. areas so they're not, um, it's not at the, ex at so much. The, the thing with lat pull downs is your nervous system fatigues much slower than a pull up. So you can, as P Phil said, you can do many, many more reps, more volume on it uh, in a workout. And um, for bodybuilding, that's necessary. You know, it's, it 
does it carry over to real life? No, not much at all. But um, that's all right if that's yeah. what you're trying to do. So we're uh, running a bit out of time here. So we, we probably won't get to Grace's question today, but we'll, we'll definitely um, get back in touch and probably even talk about it tomorrow on tomorrow's show. But Aiden's just got a question here about... Um, progressing to muscle up so we'll maybe finish this question off and then wrap things up so he's saying Yanni do you recommend I'm here as well man (laughs) it's all good Um, what what do you recommend for progressing past the foundations program muscle ups is definitely one of my goals so should I finish the three foundation phases and then do muscle up or do a few meso cycles of the progressions program Uh, if you're um I would absolutely, uh, my, the way I used to train people is that everyone went through a foundations phase and, uh, you know, we got to a point where we were able to create sort of a blueprint of a foundation that would build a pretty good body. If we're working with people individually, we might slightly alter the program based on looking at them and, tra- and training them. But for everyone else, that foundations program is amazing. Um, it just really helps to balance the body and, and set that good foundation. Um, from that point on, brother, the really this the sky's the limit for you if you if, if if a big goal of yours is to do a muscle up then i would dive straight into the muscle up program and swap it out for ch- um uh, monday and thursday's workouts in the progressions program so rather than doing the usual monday thursday progressions workouts you'll do the muscle up masterclass on those two days and a lot of our uh students in the gym here do that yeah uh, i'd agree with that except that uh with Goals again. We've we talked about goals so much in the the very first week of the year, and one of the thing the really important things about goal setting is 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 thinking quite hard about it and thinking, am I just getting distracted by something shiny and something that's maybe you know driven by some part of your ego that isn't going to serve your the rest of your sort of overall health? And in that case, like a lot of people are like, oh, you know, tick off a muscle up just for sort of that ego hit rather than maybe what's best for your body so um i think maybe like if you do just want to do muscle ups like all power to you jump right in but sometimes it 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 might be a bit of a better idea to like take a bit more time on the progressions just to build up again more of that strong foundation if you i'm not sure aiden how how much training you've done in the past but just to really build up that foundation and then tackle the muscle ups once you've sort of you know really got a good grasp of of your strength and fitness but you know if you just want to do muscle ups and that's going to be the thing that keeps you engaged and happy and and like excited about training then that's like the biggest thing you can do is yeah. just stay engaged in your training so I, jump I, right in and, I, and go if, for it. if in in a perfect world and this is why we designed it um aiden do the foundations program, then do the superhuman strength program, and then start looking at um, specific goals. Because the superhuman strength program that you guys have access to, it's not my program. It's a program I designed specifically for you guys as a bridge between foundations and the progressions program. And it's a really nice way of building some, like, brute strength on top of your really nice balanced body that you've produced through that um, uh, foundations program. Yeah. And I said that was going to be our last question, but because Quark has uh, D- got, he's, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I he's just addressed that. both me and... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give you my opinion here. Um, <laughs> Quark, very quickly, uh, th- this is subjective based on the individual's conditioning level because one and of so the so it's asking problems, for a beginner um, who wants to do a pull-up, how should they start? Yeah, how should they start and how many times a week uh, should they train for the pull-up? Um, now, th- th- the pull-up is heavily, like pull-up training is very demanding on the forearms and the gripping muscles. And one of the worst problems is to get um, an overuse injury in the forearms and the gripping muscles or, or the elbows. It's something that's very hard to get rid of once you get it. Uh, of course, I'm sort of referring to like um, uh, uh, te- uh, tendinopathy. Tendinopathy yeah, in the so um, in, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> right. I was going to say tendinopathy for first time ever. Tendinopathy in the um, flexors or extensors, and um, it's yeah, you need to manage that. You need to, yeah, need to manage and, load really. Hit and hard Aiden, that's there. why I was saying like an extra, like a, the more time you can do in the progressions, probably the better. If you have not got a old training age with this sort of training, because we, I just found that. Like the most common thing I end up seeing in the gym is people who have these, you know, tendinopathy issues just from jumping really hard into calisthenics too yeah. hard too early. Yeah. And I think the muscle ups are a classic one for, yeah, <laughs> for setting that off. Time, so, big time. like, I'm not saying, yeah, I really just. Um, to answer your question at the end, Quok, uh, in my experience, barring body composition issues, so if the person is carrying additional weight, that needs to be addressed first. But if they're at a healthy body composition, 12 to 16 weeks, you should get one pull up. That's my experience. If I'm yeah. training someone one on one, and their goal is to do a pull up, then I, I, if I, if it was after, if if they'd been training consistently with me and it was 16 weeks and they still couldn't do it, there's something wrong with my program. Uh, yeah, just on that, like I just challenged that last idea about 
uh, dealing with the um, body composition issue first, I think concurrently. Like No, no, <laughs> yeah. no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Look, so, the thing is, if someone's carrying be, additional weight, what yeah. I mean by that, guys, is if someone's carrying uh, um, excess body fat, it's going to take longer. Yeah. And so, so you need to be addressing that through nutritional intervention and things like that as well. But yeah, if you've yeah. got a clean you slate of You can always be someone, moving forward. Yeah, that's with right. If, you, if you've got a clean slate of a male between 10 to 15% body fat and a female between 15 to 22% body fat, which is quite lean for both, then you're not going to be impaired by the, uh, the, uh, the body fat. You know, they, they should be able to just develop strength and that'll be fine. Yep. yep. For sure. Cool. That's it, guys. That's all we've got time for. We went a bit over time today. Yeah, lots of really good questions. Yeah, Appreciate we did. The, um, Thank you very much. There, so. Tomorrow we will talk about um, uh, Grace's uh, comment. And um, uh, yeah, I, I'm excited about this one because there's a lot, there's a lot yeah, in there. Yeah, really good and, stuff to dive um, into. And there's so. some stuff, good stuff to dive into around mindset. Cool. Peace out. Health is about performance, not just body image. You better be willing to accept <laughs> totally. what you're going to have to do to get there. We'll start focusing on movement goals, strength goals, flexibility goals. When you nail that skill, it's there forever. The body image goal doesn't get you that far. It's the consistency and frequency that's going to get you there. It's not the intensity. There's no shortcut to mastery and movement. Destination doesn't change overnight, but your direction will. The gym is not the place to beat up the body that you hate. It's the place to build the body that you love. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image.